welcome to this CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. By joining or scheduling a hangout, you can ask questions, work through tutorials, share ideas, or pair program on open source projects. Today we're going to be continuing working on our sustainable urban design project. Uh, this is a live coding hangout, meaning we're going to figure things out as we go. It's not a tutorial or tutorial series, but we do have a goal today. And I usually try to, to summarize the videos in the last uh, 10 to 20 minutes of these uh, live code hangouts. So if you're just interested in seeing what we did, what we achieved today, or, or fail or struggled with, um, go towards the end of the video. It's hard to tell exactly how long the summary will take, but it's usually 10 to 20 minutes. So what we've got here is uh, in our previous sessions, we were able to download data from OpenStreetMap using a really great Python library called uh, OSMNX. It lets you query OpenStreetMap data by location or tag. There's a lot of different options. And it downloads it to a data frame, what's called a geodata frame, with this um, package called GeoPandas. These geodata frames have a lot of helper functions, including things that just helped us um, throughout the analysis to be able to show the data uh, visually or create new columns based on the uh, existing columns. And in the end, we were able to do even some um, rather complicated uh, mathematical and spatial operations to um, produce a map and this underlying data can then be stored either back uh, to disk in any of various geoformats, or it can be persisted in a, a database, a geodatabase, like SQLite or PostGIS. So I think what we're going to do today is just work on getting hmm, either raw data from OpenStreetMap and storing it in Postgres, or working with some shape files from, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, hold on a second. Uh, Geofabric. I think that Geofabric is a really good approach because they kind of split the data out into several useful layers. If we hop over here to QGIS, we can actually see th these are all shape files that I downloaded from Geofabric. And each of them shows either a building footprint in this case, or land use and zoning, for example, parks along the waterfront, or correct layer. Uh, commercially zoned la uh, area, residential zoning. So the industrial, yeah, there's a new uh, sustainable urban uh, de development project here. Um, in Hayden Ranta. Coming up. But in any, in any case, um, this OSMNX package can load in these geo, uh, these shape files. I believe there's even OSM XML files. And then write it into a PostGIS database. So we actually have a, a PostGIS database running here. Uh, in the last session, what we did is just created a Docker Compose file that lets us start a PostGIS server locally. Uh, with a command, a single command. You can find the source code on GitHub, Sustainable Urban Design. And while we're developing, we're moving towards having our data stored in a proper geospatial database as, instead of a flat um, SQLite file or even, um, I think there's ex geographic extensions for um, SQLite as well. So yeah, our, just, our uh, Docker Compose is pretty simple right now. Once we can get the data into PostGIS though, we're gonna start working back on the client code and, and populating maps in our, our prototype JavaScript client. 
these past few sessions have been more experimental and kind of getting things prepared to serve it through the Django project. So I've already downloaded these GeoFabric shapefiles. Now there's like at least half a dozen ways to get data, OpenStreetMap data into Postgres. This tool is a command line tool that essentially replicates the OpenStreetMap uh, data structure and including some internal implementation details that are made for rendering the two-dimensional, the um, rasterized map. I don't think those implementation details are uh, relevant to our analysis. And in fact, they're one lower level lower in terms of abstraction than we were able to get from the geofabric data here, where it actually sh you know shows us places of uh, points of interest or building zones, land use, natural features, places of worship. Um, these are more kind of meaningful in terms of human meaning than so much f for the computer optimized um, things that, such as being able to render raster graphics efficiently. Another important feature uh, that is lacking and that we're going to need is um, a sense of uh, what's called uh, sort of the contiguity of these or the um, topology of the street network, for example, or the relationships of other geometries there. The raw open street map dump does not preserve topology. Uh, I think it's really verbose and it's, again, mainly architected to efficiently render uh, this two-dimensional slippy map, which is not our goal at the moment. Uh, so I've, I've just done a, a cursory analysis of how to get the data in and out, and I believe this OSMNX strikes the right balance in terms of giving us a toolkit in Python that we can build into an automated process. And has some nice features, including keeping the network's uh, network topology intact, specifying, you know, like subquerying and getting points of interest, um, downloading by region. Simplifying the network for, uh, for example, finding the intersections, not only just the, all the geometrical um, properties and nodes, we actually just care about intersection and crosswalks and things like that. Doing geostatistics is quite a, an interesting project. Um, so we'll find out now if there's a way to load shapefiles into OSMNX or if I should just be querying OpenStreetMap directly, which is okay as well. When we do query OpenStreetMap directly, everything's into one, in one big table. We get nodes and ways, and it's really um, kind of a wide table. So let's see if there's Python, shapefile, to um, Geodata frame, and actually, now that I recall, GeoPandas is going to be the layer here. Uh, we'll probably not need OSM and X at all for this process. So let's go ahead and create a new notebook. Firstly, and we'll rename it. We'll give a little bit of context here. We'll need an end-to-end -end process. And more or less, I think the conversion, this is not accurate. I just don't want to dwell on it too much. The conversion's already been done, I think, by GeoFabric. And I think we can just, when we go to automate this, uh, 
their download URL is fairly hmm, fairly static. It's it's a tricky one because, um, like I said, I'm figuring this stuff out as I go. But with this OSM index, we can just query. I want I want Finland, Tampere, Finland. Whereas with um, GeoFabric, we have to kind of figure out how to traverse there um, near directory structure and things like that. The download server, which I think is going to be stable over time. And you can see these um, file sizes are pretty big. Another thing that they do is anonymize the data, so that's pretty good. And they do daily extracts, and they ah, and they do have a JSON index, so that's good. So there may be a way that we could enhance this later to be able to traverse. Uh, into deeper layers, but essentially it looks like a server with 100 gigs of storage, say, like a dedicated post, uh, post GIS instance with 100 gigs of storage could be suitable to host all of, the da all of this data from GeoFabric. Okay, so like I said, I've got the, the data stored locally. We'll optimize this later. And we're going to work with all of Finland's data. And there's so many layers here. What we want to do. I think our approach will be something like get a list of all the shape files in this directory, iterate over that list, open each shape file into memory as a data frame, and then store that data frame in uh, PostGIS. I think um, based on my work with pandas previously, GeoPandas is going to abstract a lot of this from us in terms of creating the table if it doesn't exist, uh, overriding the data. And in the long run, I think it'll be worth just treating the OpenStreetMap data as kind of immutable source of truth and making derivatives downstream in either other databases or other table, tables, uh, or even um, sometimes at query time, you can just compute things. PostGIS is pretty fast, for example, calculating areas. Um, I was doing an experiment to, of that today, essentially. If we hop over to dbeaver, I've got um, I've already done a test of loading this OSM data into Postgres. It's actually remarkably easy. Once in QGIS, if you just load some shape files into a project and then connect to a PostGIS server, um, you can drag and drop <laughs> the files into PostGIS and it handles everything. So that is pretty cool. The thing is, this can't be automated. It's a manual process. And here's an example. Once I've got the data in there, I can uh, look up the land use column and then get the name uh, and feature class. So the name would be like the name of a location in human terms. Oh, there we go. This is 
some company, it's a retail company, and then run it. Um, it imports it by default as a geometry column, and so we cast it to a geography and calculate the area here. But this runs on 60,000 rows. Um, let's see if we can get the timing here. How do we do that? I forget there. Oh, in a couple of seconds. So you can make derived features um, almost in the time t uh, at a request, like in the time of a request would return a value, that, you know, two seconds to return a value from a uh, HTTP request is on the long end of the spectrum. Uh, but these could also be materialized. Um, so yeah, we're just going to be able to work more deep, deeply with uh, different types of geo queries, spatial queries, and geocomputational processes, I think. Uh, in PostGIS can bring a lot of value. All right, we're going to want to glob a directory of files. Now let's see. Well, let's see. Open shapefile. We'll do it one step at a time before I get to. Uh, so yeah, and I think I already know how this is going to work. It's essentially, you say. Um, I'm gonna make this a little bit generic, but uh, uh, let's just say buildings was a big one. Start with something small, and this is also listing all the files because it's not filtering. It's just I need the shape files. Mm. One should be okay. Yeah, so this is pretty much the the format we'll be dealing with. There's the identifier from OpenStreetMap, the identifier for um, GeoPandas, which I think will drop in the process of working with the data. A code, which is the numeric representation of the feature class. I think they go hand in hand. I'm not sure what width is some metadata relating to waterways, I guess. I don't know. Uh, the name of the waterway and then a line string representing the, the waterway's uh, topography center line. So we know how to do that. That's good. Uh, then you have a two SQL operation. I believe. And for this, we'll need a connection. Uh, it can automatically uh, create uh, the schema, or we could specify it. If it exists, we can specify what to do. By default, they won't override data. But since this is kind of um, immutable in the sense that we're not going to be adding, we're not going to be making any changes to this after the fact, uh, we could override the data with fresh data, I think. Uh, would be fine. It might tr kick off a uh, series of other derived uh, tasks. I don't have to know. We have cross that bridge when it arises. This index is whether or not it'll use the pandas index, which we don't want. Uh, and it'll chunk the data if you have like 60,000, 400,000 rows, which you know, some of the um, OpenStreetMap data set sets have that number, uh, that magnitude at least. You can chunk those. So we'll need to create a SQL alchemy connection. And we could do the replace if need be. I think we could specify that the OSMID is the index.
All right, so we'll need a sequel. I mean, let's see if we've got that. Nope. All right, so we'll install it in our environment. Inevitably, I need to look up how to make a SQL Alchemy connection. This is not very secure, but it's just for development purposes. Ah, yes, I could you too. I'm surprised if it, I guess for connecting to Postgres, it, you need this additional package. It doesn't assume any database backend. We were able to do that without any problem. I think normally I'd have to install PsychoPG2 binary. Just behind me, I remember having problems with that. Which might have been why it took uh, a little bit longer to install because it was compiling something behind the scenes. And obviously it succeeded in that case, but I've had problems where the where installing PsychoPG2 is problematic because uh, developer dependencies aren't available on a, mach on a computer and so you can't build the binary. <coughs> Frankly, if there's already a binary built, just use that. Don't waste resources and time. All right, so before I shut down the server next time, I'll just have to be more careful to save right now. Specifying it. Okay, cool. All right, let's check these details out again. We essentially, just need the connection. Actually, if I 
If I want to use OSM ID as an index, I think I just set the index here, and then it'll be fine. go with the defaults on most everything. Um, this is 72,000 rows, so that's good good uh, size. Let's go ahead and just delete these tables for now. So I don't know how this will work. Let's just give it a try. There we go. Make sure that's good. And then All right. name. What does name represent? String. Table name, I think. Okay, that's going to be a little bit of a challenge when I do this. Hmm. I can get the file in, but then let's just do it for now. If these file names don't change, though, then I'll be able to kind of create a dictionary. Not many people having this problem. Okay, great, spammy.
one thing, this could be a misleading um, error. It might be that the engine is not a connection. Let's see. No, it doesn't, it doesn't need that. This is a very strange error. Well, and so it's trying to infer it. So one thing I can do is just tell it what the uh, the data types are here, and so we just step around this. So I guess there could be cases where the geometry column is got a null value. I might need geoalchemy here to handle this um, geospatial data type. I think that's the problem. <laughs> then it'll, this problem will go away. Uh, SQL alchemy doesn't handle this by default because the spatial extensions aren't built into these databases for the most part. PostGIS is an extension. This is the case. That's a very opaque error, but I can kind of see. Well, I mean, it makes sense that uh, SQL Alchemy wouldn't know how to handle that, or it's looking for a, uh, an attribute on a type data type it doesn't know about. In this case, we want GeoAlchemy. Not. 
Let's just try reverting this back. SQL Alchemy, getting the data. This is sort of variable. So we'll put that out there. I was hoping this would be a little bit easier. So just most there's a walk known text. Hmm. These are fairly more com complicated, convoluted to dance around it. All right, first let me make sure I've got the uh, right. Did you welcome me install? No. Yeah, this just reinforces why at every step of the way there's some kind of gotcha. Maybe that's just the life of a developer, but um, well, yeah, I guess urban al analysis uh, analysts would probably be working with the shape files directly. But in every step of the way, there's something that's weird and esoteric you have to figure out about spatial data types or um, geometric operations. I don't know. It's just uh, really tedious. It bogs you down every step of the way. You got to just struggle. 
you know, and this is working with a high level language with a lot of abstractions and really good libraries, and it's still a tedious process. In the first class, you know, GIS toolkit like QGIS. But it really, to me, reinforces the reason we need a simple, user friendly tool for urban planning and analysis. Uh, we don't want to relegate planners to this level of the infrastructure. They, this just takes people away from <laughs> their domain of expertise and in a way it kind of saps your dreams and saps your energy. <laughs> you just got to figure everything out all the way. So now it's no longer a geodata frame. It looks the same because it's the well-known text version of it, and it's just warning us. And really kind of unfortunate we have to step down in a layer of abstraction. I think this should almost be supported by uh, geopandas. then you have to cast it back again. And I don't know, it's just brittle. Why? Do we have to go through this loop to cast it to a text and then cast it back into a point? Or do we? Maybe this is sufficient. I guess we're really close. Uh, programming error.
Okay, let's see what the geometry types are allowed first. I think that might be a step. The deal is we're going to have to figure out to automate this, I'll have to have a dictionary that has the geometry type as well. Text might need to be true. I'm going to skip this step. Got that. This is still good. This is, I think, an optional argument. Ah, right, right. Hey, we're getting somewhere. Uh, at least it's failing with a different error. Anything has gotten, it's been inserted. No, nothing. Hmm. hmm. Back to the drawing board. Yeah, I've read this article several times now. All right. So we can prepare our own SQL, which I've done in the past at work. Here's a command line tool. I'd, I'd prefer to do this in Python. Because this relies on several things. You'd have to have some, likely some dependencies installed here, and you have to have Postgres or PSQL installed on your lo local environment. Similar with OGR, you have to have Godal and OGR installed. QGIS works like a charm. Could look at their implementation. This is the really the use case reference. You're integrating PostGIS to an application and want to automate things. GUI workflows are not viable options. So you might want to look into loading data with Python. The most obvious choice for making a connection. 
Psycho PG2. Oh, I'm using the wrong method. To post JS. Really cool. Alright, alright. So I don't need these hoops. Let's go ahead and step back a little bit. So just make sure everybody This is pretty fresh too. the article several times but I did not quite catch that little link there <laughs> so we ran this and just do it again Boom. something's happening cool we are one hour into it and we might have some good results so it's uh, Oftentimes, not a lot of code to do certain things, especially with abstract languages, uh, languages with high levels of abstraction and cohesion like Python. But getting there is daunting a little bit. Not too bad, but yeah. <laughs> Just, I think it would throw people and really shouldn't be, people's time could be used otherwise. Uh, which, granted, this is already a really uh, blessing, so please don't think I'm complaining too much. But I just want to acknowledge that not everybody is working at this layer of the cake. So if we just review the data, see if we can refresh it. It's got 24 kilobytes of data. Let's refresh that real quick. 40 megs of data. That's more like it. All right. Now we can make things more generic. And what I think I'll do is just yeah commit this save it that's good and it'll be a matter of like creating a data dictionary perhaps which may already exist and maybe adjacent uh data dictionary so to speak so let's go ahead yes so they are using geochemy too
and this is essentially And is there documentation on this?
Okay. I like that. Clean, clean solution. All right. Cool. Thank you again, Jispo there in Finland. Also, I've actually I've been in contact with the uh, the founder of Jispo on a few occasions. And he's really active in the uh, open source OSGO community. All right, we're at one uh, one hour. I'm trying to think if there's if I should take the next step and try to iterate over all these, make the dictionary and upload them all. Maybe it might be a good way to do it. I don't think it would take too much. And I'll add some narrative here as well. Essentially, you know, this is a list. I could just pass the file name, not have to maintain the mapping. Then we could just dump a bunch of shape files in a directory and upload them. I don't know how abstract I want this to be. Because we can glob for this pattern that matches something.shp in this folder. And then with that glob, we get a bunch of file instances and grab the file name, file prefix. I don't want to get too elaborate here, though. All right, now just want to do it.
Let me just do a quick test here. Let's see what properties there are on this. On these file instances. Okay, it's a string. All right, all right. So one thing we can do is I glob this and then split it on the dot. long to make this abstract as if it were to just Now, this read read file might actually take an, a file instance, file-like object. So what we can do is actually open the file here, and then
file name. File object, which I think explicit is better than implicit here. Basically what I'm dealing with is just implicitly getting the file uh, file name and using that for the table. And if the file name is ever switched format, then uh, it'll be a little bit more mysterious why things are breaking downstream. Well, maybe we'll notice that we don't have updated data in a table. Whereas if I do things explicitly here, it'll be obvious that the file name is not available. Okay, so let's go back to what I'm doing here. Uh, remembering this in a Python. It's possible it's going to be more opaque here. The table map is a little redundant, but here we go. Uh, not verbose, not necessarily redundant, but uh, all right. So we need to do that's the one thing. That, uh, the shape file. land use. Actually, this is what I should have copied. What was that, 13? So A31. Hmm. I don't see the difference here. So natural A free one. I guess the difference is one's a path with a file or something. I don't know why. The duplication.
Thanks, A though. And this gives me the opportunity to give more meaningful names, and we could probably figure out better names here as well. Oops, it's going too fast. Points of interest, we have places of worship, points of, uh, points of interest A, and I think it's just the geometry is different. Points and polygons. Once we've loaded it in, and actually I can check this right now. We hop over to QGIS. All right, so we've got, let's see, places A, free and places. So places free and places A. So places A is the polygon, places is the point. Let's see if that's a similar pattern for place of worship, polygons. be okay just to mix these uh, data types into a single table at some point we'll figure out how we're going to use them just so we have a places table and a points of places of worship table and a places table separately and then combine those um, multi multiple poly multiple geometries into a single column I don't know all right so where are we at places I think this next one's gonna be points of interest, polygon. Not down here. We have points of worship. I've skipped. Places of worship. All oversight. Dang it. <laughs> oh, 
Roy Casty. Wait, 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 wait. All right, dude. There we go. All right, we're getting there. Slowly but surely, you can see this is very error prone. Once it's done, it's done. It's explicit, it gives us an opportunity to make more human uh, readable layer names. So polygons here have just been loading before shaped. I'm just gonna try to be, for the points, I'm just gonna be trying to be uh, consistent here. Keep loading the projections. I'll just spot check this. So anything that's got the, uh, oh, I can see it right here. The A in there. It's a polygon, otherwise it's just whatever the natural uh, shape would be, either a pointer or line string, depending. Got traffic. Oh. Transport.
All right, <clears throat> let's give this a try. Uh -huh. I was switching between uh, JavaScript and Python causes just confusion. Okay. I'm gonna try something though. No, no, there's a multi -curs cursor support. I think the multi or support would end up putting the quotation mark. It would replace the text instead of maybe quoting it. Who knows? This is why it's nice to have an actual pair programming partner because they could spot stuff like that. Navigator. All right, let's see if this works. Whew, all right, now we're going to try to um, do a bulk operation here. It's going to take a little bit. I'm going to load it, hop over to um, dbeaver and clear out our data, our table. So we have nothing but these spatial reference systems. Oops. And basically, we're going to loop over each of these. Okay, <laughs> let's see how long it takes. Make sure everything's good. Point. Create the engine. And go. And this is where we might want to grab a T. is if I can blame switching back and forth between JavaScript for that or just general confusion around how Python dictionaries work a little bit of both I'm just generally confusable alrighty oh yeah alright on this note I'm gonna take a quick break check on the status of my tea and stretch a little bit <laughs> thanks for hanging out I'll be right back
All right, still chugging along there. Let's uh, go ahead and peek over here, though. The data should more or less be streaming in. Um, so if we refresh our tables, we might have a few of the tables already. Let's double check. might be actually That's strange would be waiting for this whole process to uh, complete before committing the transaction See why this would be handling it differently. It seems I'm getting looks like the kernel just fried. So yeah, that's not going to be. It's not going to work, is it? Let me. <laughs> Problem is, this building is the one of the biggest uh, tables. Essentially, 700 megs or somewhere in that ballpark. And the land use is the second biggest one. Might be preparing. It should be inserting it row by row. Uh, what's the default behavior? We'd like to chunk the data. That memory is growing, though. Swap is maxed out also. So at the, that point, the saturates my system memory. It won't work, will it? So from what I can tell, there's something really. Restart the kernel. So if we free out that memory. So my baseline system's already using up a good amount of uh, resources. That's just Ubuntu, using them four gigs just to run, <laughs> just to have the lights on. Well, plus uh, I take that back. I got Firefox running, uh, which is probably taking up a sizable OBS, Java, Firefox. What Java? DBver. Yeah. So let's go ahead and. Uh, hmm. Not that it matters too much. I, I think this code is the issue. It just needs to be optimized. I could also increase my swap. Um,
before I go to that extent, why, why can't, why does this grow? Why does those uh, data frames never get memory managed or garbage collected? That's the confusing part. Look at these file sizes here. It's going to be a little bit different. Um, granted, since we're converting the format, let's see the shape files here. There. It's like it just capped out, and then. Kernel died, so yeah, it's maximizing. maximizing it. It's taking as much, it's like taking it to the ceiling, basically. What I think I need to do is either chunk it, chunk the data. Because loading a, this data frame into the memory, that's pretty minuscule. By default, all rows will be written at once. So I think what it's doing is preparing a huge SQL statement and then, and then trying to jam that down the pipe. So yeah, that's not going to work, is it? So let's just say get a balance. Why is it chunk size? Is that what it's called? Chunk size. So a thousand rows at a time. And again, we're just going to try it on this relatively small data frame and watch our memory usage. And it should kind of come up and drop down, come up and drop down, come up and drop down.
again, none of this really has anything to do with the goal is to be able to do urban analysis and we're just tangled up and pretty low level stuff, having to optimize inserting data into a post GIS database, um, chunking it, considering table names. Uh, don't want people to have to go through this kind of struggle. Okay, so it looks like it prepared the tape uh, file, a thousand row SQL file. I guess it's pretty sizable. Now it can upload that. Now that, uh, okay, we got another thing. There's a file or directory. I guess it's waterways somehow. I think this is the one I just filled it in. Okay, now that was for the polygon layer, um, which would be more complicated geometry-wise than for the line layer. So I think uh, it's gonna be manageable. Now my memory hasn't been managed though. We haven't, that memory hasn't been freed up. Try a hundred rows at a time. It's honestly looking like uh, this might be best done at, at the command line utility. Um, I have to test out the performance of that. If we have just a dedicated server, uh, which seems kind of ludicrous, but some kind of process that's designed to handle this on a scheduled basis. This would probably be a good job for like a, a Lambda or some kind of server that you spin up and, and goes back down after it's done the uh, geoprocessing. Lambda is not the right one. Lambda is not the right architecture here. But I think 100 row trunk size might be good as long as the Memory man memory usage plateaus, and this process could just run. And gets garbage collected there. And just for reference, let me see what happens if I if I run this garbage collector.
Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have to do some more experiments. Probably I'll do these off stream, but uh, it's surprising me that the memory is not reducing. Let me just double check now over here in uh, dBeaver that we got some data. Yeah, we do, as expected, I suppose. Um, water polygon layer. Yeah, I just think it, when it was trying to do a huge single insert with these pretty complicated geometries, uh, I can understand now why um, why the thing died. Let's see, how do we check the number of rows? 353,000 or so, 383,000 rows, quite a lot of uh, rows there. And 72,000 rows here in the uh, waterways with pretty complicated line strings. So yeah, we have to chunk it, that was a key thing. And generally that's just another reminder of doing things in smaller batches. Uh, it just comes in a different guise here. <laughs> uh, whereas it was abstracted a little bit and maybe it could default to batching things, I don't know. They, uh, the sensible default here may be to do things uh, in one big uh, statement. I almost could default, I don't know, one row at a time is a lot on the network I.O. All right, we got a little bit of memory back. It took a couple of minutes just to do these um, table, well, 380,000 rows, if I recall correctly, and then uh, 72,000 rows. That's not trivial with 100 um, size batches. I'm gonna go ahead and take this off, off stream and uh, I'll commit and push this a little bit later tonight. I'm going to benchmark it, get all this data inserted. Um, but I'll go ahead and summarize it now because I think we're at a, a pretty good um, point uh, where things would make sense to summarize it. All right, so in summary, today we've been working to insert OpenStreetMap data into PostGIS. There's a really useful article on um, let me skip that. On JISPO website. Where they kind of give us an overview of all the options. And uh, here it is, importing spatial data into PostGIS. Uh, we sort of reviewed these options here. Uh, a lot of them uh, will either rely on a command line utility or something similar. Um, I wanted to keep this, or a graphical user interface. I wanted to keep this all in Python. So our goal here would be to automate the process on a server on a daily or weekly basis. And we're already using Python and Django, so we might as well keep things kind of in the same language family. Um, what we've got here is we're using GeoPandas and SQL Alchemy. And we created a SQL Alchemy engine. I've got Postgres running. In our last um, session, we created a Docker Compose file to run Postgres SQL uh, locally so we could spin it up and tear it down uh, while persisting the data um, without having to have it running on my local development machine all the time. So we connect to that and I had a few options, but essentially what I've done is downloaded the data to a directory. It's a bunch of shape files, and these come from uh, GeoFabric. Um, there's also several ways of obtaining OpenStreetMap data of various degrees of abstraction. Um, there's even a way to directly query it using OSMNX, which we've used in a previous session. I think the GeoFabric provides a good uh, compromise. It has, it offers things in shapefile format, and it separates them out into some interesting layers that I th think are natural ways of uh, uh, conceiving or conceptualizing the data, like land use, natural features, places of worship, places of interest, rails and roadways, water features. So, whereas if we just do a raw OSM dump, uh, we're just going to get things abstracted in a way that's, uh, or like less than abstracted, it's uh, structured in a way that's useful for OpenStreetMap and rendering a st static uh, slippy map. 
Um, it's useful for styling it and rendering those uh, two-dimensional data, but it's not going to give us um, more natural concepts to work with. And I think also an issue is the topology is not preserved, which we might have to come to later. In any case, we've downloaded these data files here. And I rather than implicitly using like the file name and splitting it out and creating a table name based on the file name or something like that, uh, I just went with explicit is better than implicit. I created a, a little bit verbose, but in any, in any case, it's a file name, file path to table mapping. So um, it gives it a little bit more meaningful name, easier to interpret when we get it into uh, the database. And I'm not going to run this next code, uh, this next uh, thing on the server. It takes just for importing two um, fairly large layers. It took a couple of minutes. And I maxed out my memory. You can see I'm profiling the RAM here. Um, I have to figure out uh, why uh, the garbage collector is not kind of cleaning up uh, after the fact. But in any case, uh, I, I learned a valuable lesson again to work in small batches or chunks. So. I'll read this code real quick. We, this is a cell magic that just says time this cell, see how long it takes. And I created that table map again. It's just dictionaries with a file path and a table name. And for each of those, we're going to open the geodata frame, open the shape file into a geodata frame. And each of those shape files, uh, each of the items has an OSM ID value. And uh, rather than using just some arbitrary data frame index, we're just going to use the OpenStreetMap ID. Um, so I kind of did that in place here. There's a, I, that also could have been done here uh, during the insert. But in the final thing, there's a new uh, ish, as of May, method on the geo data frames to post GIS. This actually took me an hour <laughs> to arrive at this conclusion. And really, if I had just read this just both article a little bit closer, they had mentioned it among these other resources. So thank you, Jispo, uh, for providing this uh, information. And Specifically, they re they even pointed here that GeoPandas now has this new method. I just went the long way to get back to that same point. And essentially, it's using the same uh, arguments uh, as the pandas to SQL um, method, which I was originally trying, but had great difficulty with the geometry column. This PostGIS handles that for us. Underneath things, it's using GeoAlchemy 2 and uh, PsychoPG2, uh, as well as SQLAlchemy 2. We give it a reference to our connection in, uh, engine defined up here. And we are inside of a loop, so we just say the table name is going to be the item table name. And here I'm not worried about preserving the old data, and in fact, we probably won't be if we're just updating on a batch process. We would replace those tables. And the key uh, thing is, by default, this will create a single SQL statement for the whole data frame, uh, which I think on most cases is probably going to be fairly excessive, but in particular with these um, geodata frames and these geometry columns that can be, uh, you know, hundreds of geometry, hundreds of points with varying degrees of decimal accuracy. This is a huge SQL statement, and there's like some like 300,000 rows. And essentially, it, it took all my computer memory. I was kind of figuring out why. So the solution so far has been to chunk it into 100 rows at a time and then insert that. And it worked a couple of minutes. So yeah, it's one of those things. Have a cup of tea while you wait for it. Uh, I'm going to test this out further off the stream and clean up the notebook. Um, but as long as my computer doesn't totally um, crash, the kernel, the Python kernel, it does safely bail out before uh, the computer kind of stalls with, with no memory. Um, as long as things work, I think this will be uh, a reasonable stopping point. And by default, I think Ubuntu is already using four gigs of my memory. So this could run on a, an Ubuntu server instance, for example, uh, with maybe uh, only using about four to six gigabytes, depending on how well it's optimized. If it doesn't work, I'm back to the drawing board, and I'll, I'll probably use one of those command line utilities. All right. Well, this has been quite a learning journey today, learning experience today, and we're getting closer to being able to display some um, 
specific urban data on a slippy map um, under our control, displaying things for analytical purposes, such as food sources and creating buffers around those food sources. The pieces are coming into the picture. It's just each um, step of the way has got its own unique challenges. And I've repeated this uh, on the stream, but we're trying to solve these challenges, overcome these challenges so that we can create a nice abstraction so that urban planners and, and activists and community advocates can just think in terms of how they'd like their communities to be organized, what they'd like to improve, and not have to worry about the whole supporting layer of spatial data infrastructure, data types, um, you know, databases, all this kind of stuff that throws us, uh, you know, six different ways every time we work with it. It's interesting, don't get me wrong, and I, I'm really grateful for the level of um, capability that the Python ecosystem has and that people are building around these um, two projects like OpenStreetMap and communities like OpenStreetMap, but at the same time, I just recognize there's a huge need to make things much simpler and bring these tools to bear on really important issues that's you know, sustainability and sustainable urban design, which is of paramount importance for our generation and future generations. Cool. So this has been a CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. If you'd like to get involved with this project, stop by github.com slash sustainable urban design. CodeBuddies is a great community to get involved with this and similar projects. There's all sorts of study groups and hangouts going on on a daily basis, and CodeBuddies platform itself is open source. You can stop by github.com slash CodeBuddies or the CodeBuddies front page to get involved with that project. I appreciate everybody's time. I hope you're doing well out there and stay healthy.